The global movement against free trade and capitalism that first came together at the 1999 protests against the World Trade Organization coalesced around the idea that Western elites had led third world nations to get ensnared in a debt trap as a way to coerce them into adopting neoliberal policies. When poor nations couldn't afford to repay what they owed the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund, these Washington-based organizations agreed to restructure the loans of debtor countries if they would agree to move in the direction of privatization, deregulation, and free trade, a policy agenda termed shock therapy. Leftist leaders like Hugo Chavez claimed that this was part of a pattern of elite subjugation of Latin America that stretched all the way back to Christopher Columbus. Chavez used this as evidence in support of Venezuela's turn toward Cuba-style socialism. Aquellas políticas del Fondo Monetario Internacional de las cuales inyectaron una sobredosis especialmente a los países de la América Latina. Y se nos vino en avalancha la propuesta del consenso de Washington, el neocolonialismo vestido de una tesis Columbia University's Joseph Stieglitz, a former chief economist at the World Bank and a Nobel Prize winning critic of free market capitalism, promoted the same narrative. He blamed the Washington consensus for pushing policies he deemed too radical and wrongheaded to ever get through in the U.S. What is your criticism of the World Bank and the IMF and, and all that they were doing? In many ways, they were pursuing policies pushing developing countries to have policies that were very different from the policies that we were working for or supported at home. I mean, for instance, privatization of social security. But, so, like, generally speaking, IMF programs are designed to prevent Western-style social democracies. They're designed to prevent free health care and education. They're designed to prevent even, like, modest subsidies on basic goods. Unlike Stieglitz, Alex Gladstein identifies as a classical liberal, and the Human Rights Foundation, where he works as chief strategy officer, condemns the crimes committed by socialist dictators like Chavez. Yet in his recent book, Hidden Repression, How the IMF and World Bank Sell Exploitationist Development, Gladstein argues that the story told by the radical left about these two organizations is largely correct. His work over the last few years has focused heavily on monetary colonialism, or how the US and European nations used their control of global currency to override the sovereignty of the poor nations in Latin America and Africa. The fix, he says, is for the world to transition to Bitcoin, a form of freedom money that no country or corporation can manipulate or control. Reason sat down with Gladstein at the Miami Bitcoin conference in May to talk about his new book. Why did you write Hidden Repression? What is monetary colonialism and, and why is it bad? I wrote Hidden Repression because I had a lot of questions about the IMF and World Bank. I knew that a lot of people in the global south didn't like the IMF. I knew that it had a bad reputation. I didn't have the same view about the World Bank. I felt like most people talked about the World Bank as a, maybe a neutral institution, maybe had some issues, but generally speaking, did good things. But I started to kind of just noticed that they were tied to uh, certain practices and certain phenomena that I was writing about, uh, most notably monetary colonialism in West Africa. I noticed that the IMF was kind of the instrument that the French used to kind of impose currency devaluation on its subject uh, post-colonial countries there. And I started to look around for resources last summer, and I noticed that there was no kind of pop econ book about the IMF that like that was approachable like there's no big short for the IMF <laughs> there is nothing I mean seriously there's really nothing there's there's the shock doctrine and there's like confessions of an economic hitman which are just not really what I needed you know the second one is like highly exaggerated and who knows how true it is and they're, they're just they were very kind of one-sided political texts so I just started to say, all right, well, let me dig into this. And I started to read everything I could find on the IMF World Bank, like lots of books, tons of JSTOR articles, like a <laughs> lot of credit to Sci-Hub. Like, mm -hmm. Definitely support the communist in Kazakhstan who runs Sci-Hub. You can give her Bitcoin um, to get all those free articles that otherwise are behind this like insane firewall. Um, but just tons of like JSTOR articles from the 60s, from the 70s, from the 80s, lots of books written in the 80s and 90s 
Um, and then there's just like, it just sort of ended. There just wasn't a whole lot of interest, it seemed, in these institutions. Like starting about 20 years ago, it just seemed like public interest went elsewhere. But they didn't go anywhere. In fact, they became even bigger. Um, now, they may not have the same influence in the world economy that maybe they had in 1975, but they're still the largest lender of last resort and the world's largest development bank. And China tried to copy what they did, but it, it never reached the same peak that they have. So I was like, again, I'll dig in. And I started to read everything I could get. And, you know, most of it is leftist criticism. Most of it's Marxist or leftist thought. But there's some really good libertarian stuff, too, that was written in the 90s, um, especially around the 50-year anniversary of Bretton Woods. There's a lot of retrospective. Conservatives, too, wrote some stuff. Um, they were mainly focused on their argument, basically, and this was popular in the 90s, was that these institutions were like a waste of taxpayer money. That was kind of their argument, right? Libertarians were saying, well, they're harmful and we shouldn't fund it. And, and the leftists had a different point of view. Um, I feel like the libertarian and conservative arguments are incomplete, is what I started to realize, in my, in my mind at least, that, that they weren't just inefficient and wasteful. In fact, that's not accurate. I started to realize that the IMF and World Bank were incredibly lucrative for creditor nations like the US, Germany, the UK, Japan, France, and that they really delivered big, big benefits for the creditor nations. <laughs> and, and, and I started to realize that uh, the aid and assistance that I had thought about, like I just had this natural kind of inkling that rich countries like gave aid to poor countries. And there was an aid industry, and I'd, I'd even written about that before, and I just, I knew it was corrupt and inefficient. But I thought generally, like, we were giving them stuff. I didn't realize that we were stealing from them. I didn't realize that the flow of resources and money every year goes the other way. I didn't know that. So when I started to learn about that, I was very shocked. And, and I wanted to know what kind of role the IMF and World Bank played in that transition. And I had questions. I wanted to know why did the debt of poor countries go exponential after 1970, like what would happen. So that's kind of what I started to explore with the book. And, and actually, the reason I went down the rabbit hole in the very first place was the dictator stuff. I was like, why is IMF bailing out the most brutal dictators that ever lived? You talk about Zaire as a really good example. Um, mm -hmm. I talk about Zaire. I'm going to open my talk about Zaire tomorrow, uh, spend a few minutes on it. And I'm just looking at Mobutu and I'm like, okay, I understand the Cold War stuff. But if the IMF and World Bank if they're supposed to benefit poor people, I mean, they often have this thing draped on their headquarters in DC that says end poverty. Mm -hmm. If that's true, what are they doing funding this guy who totally impoverished their country? And then you start to realize that's not what they're doing. They're, they're not, they're not lend, creating loans for these countries to benefit people there. They're doing it to benefit us. And that's the thesis of my book, which I realize is radical, but it's, it's something I just can't shake. Well, so enablement is such a big theme throughout mm -hmm. all of this. And you have the really interesting statistic in there. I believe it is Argentina has been given 22 structural mm -hmm. adjustment loans since yes. 1959 mm -hmm. by the World Bank and IMF. Mm -hmm. um, just by the IMF. Okay, just by the IMF. Yes. And yet Argentina is a place that's experienced so much hyperinflation. Yes. There, how does this enablement... Uh, get cut off? And what are some of the worst examples of this and country? To be fair, it? like the libertarian analysis has pointed out that it's not effective, yeah. basically. Like it's like, wait, these countries that have received so many adjustments, they don't pay back the debt. Um, I think, again, what it misses is that it's not a waste. It's been very effective at, at, at delivering real benefits to the West. But in any event, those benefits come in th three, three, three ways that we as Americans, let's say, benefit from, mm -hmm. from institutions like the IMF and World Bank and other kinds of lending to the, to the what we would call whatever you want to say, the third world, global south, developing countries, emerging, emerging markets. Basically, there's a billion people in our world and then everybody else, 6.7 or so billion elsewhere. Um, the first one is interest. And this is something that I didn't even really think about too deeply. Like, I, I don't even know. Like, when you're just thinking about the IMF and World Bank, maybe you think they're charity. No, they're like lenders, predatory lenders, basically. They charge very high interest rates, especially now. I mean, maybe not so much during, like, the ZERP era, but, like, certainly in the 70s and, and today. I mean, th there's also a, a spread. Like, they, like, rich countries park money there and they get paid for the pleasure at a rate and then there's a much higher rate that's charged to the poor countries so there's this cantillon effect thing where the countries that are closest to printing the money they, they benefit and and the countries that are further away have to pay more and i know you can explain some of that around geopolitical risk and everything but it's it's a big big part of the system so there's the first thing we get is interest payments so billions of dollars a year 
flow in in interest and, and repaying principal and interest from um, from the debtor countries to the creditor countries through IMF, World Bank, and all their little arms. Okay, so that's that's the first thing is is interest. Mm -hmm. The second thing is cheap resources and labor, and this is part of my thesis about how. The IMF and World Bank were originally created to do what makes to, to do pretty sensible things in the world economy. Like they were originally created to stabilize exchange rates after after Bretton Woods, which makes sense. Like all the world was pegged to the dollar, which was pegged to gold. And if you fell outside of that band of exchange rates, like the IMF would deploy capital to stabilize you mm -hmm. because we wanted trade to flow. We didn't want what happened in the 30s to happen, like competitive devaluations, autarky. Like we didn't want that. We wanted the spice to flow. That was like the idea. Um, but after 71, we went on a floating fiat standard. We no longer had a peg to the gold. So all these economists at the time were like, well, why is the IMF still in business? Especially libertarian economists were like, what's going on here? And what really ends up happening, I think, my thesis is that like, again, you've got the IMF created for a reasonable cause that, that may work under a sound money standard. Again, lender of last resort in case there's a fire. And you have the World Bank as a, as a development bank to put money into infrastructure where private capital doesn't want to go. And, and they funded war torn Europe and Japan, and they, they, they stabilized Britain as it was coming out of its crisis. And that kind of worked until, you know, 1970 or so. And then what you started to see happen in the late 60s and early 70s was like a pivot. They started to pivot their attention to, to what, what are poor countries, basically. And that's where I think they started to replace like what I would call the colonial drain. I mean, this is like uh, what colonialism did was basically get really cheap labor and resources from the periphery and deliver it to the core. This is something that Marxists have noticed. I think it's entirely true. I think their solutions are disastrous, but but I think their analysis is good in terms of, I mean, Marx himself, he observed this, like this is what big imperial powers do. They go out to the world. I mean, they, they think about the conquistadors they, and they find stuff like gold and silver and timber and oil and they steal it or they get it for very cheap and they bring it back so that the home country can be enriched. And so our standards of living can be raised and that's so that we don't get overthrown because most of us are by this point democracies. So I think that that imperial drain or colonial drain or whatever you want to call it largely ended in the early to middle part of the 20th century. And I think it was a major factor in the Great Depression. It was a major factor in the inflation crisis of the 70s. If you think about why we had the inflation crisis of the 70s, a big part of it was the rise in price of oil, which is credited directly to the fact that the OPEC countries now controlled the oil instead yeah. of us controlling it through the Seven Sisters. And like instead of us colonially controlling the energy, they controlled it and they decided to raise the price of oil and that created inflation over here. So I think like a lot can be seen when you start looking at the colonial drain and the colonial drain just started to like run out by the 60s. So we managed to recreate it, you know, by replacing like the old school warship and gun and bayonet with with debt. Yeah. And we would just extend debt to, with conditionality to these countries. And, and it started with a trickle and, it, and then it really began with a flood in the 70s. McNamara, he really, head of the World Bank, he really, really realized that like we could get a lot more influence in the world by dramatically increasing the amount of loans we could, we could give out. And this was like expedited by the petrodollar system. Like the, 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 there was just so much money parked in Western banks from, from the OPEC countries. And we were able to loan it out to all these poor countries. And there was just like, if you look at the percentage of loans to poor countries from rich countries in the 70s, it's insane. Like you had like a 400% increase between like the mid 70s and the early 80s. Well, so explain briefly, just backtrack for yeah. um, people who are watching this who haven't read your excellent yeah. book. Um, what exactly are structural adjustment loans? Sure. And what are the characteristics of them? Yeah. So like, let's say if you're Suharto in Indonesia in the 70s, and you're going to take a loan from the IMF, the IMF officials would fly out first class if it's longer than 10 hours, I think. And then it's it would the be same, business class otherwise. Same as some of the DEI consultants, like the Ibram X. Kendi, yeah. Robin Dianz, I mean, it's always, they, you have to working for the IMF time. was a sweet gig. I mean, you would stay in five-star hotels. They used, yeah. they, they used to fly in the Con They had a deal to fly in the Concorde. It was nuts. <laughs> anyway, they fly to these countries. They never go out to like the field. They like stay in like the nicest Sheraton or whatever. Mm -hmm. And they do deals with the government. And basically they say, look, what, you're running out of resources. You have a problem with your balance of payments. Like you're, you're importing too much and you're not exporting enough. Like you're, you're running out of money. Uh, your reserves are dwindling. We'll give you a loan. Like we'll give you $50, $50 million, $100 million, whatever it is. In exchange, you have to do these things. And it's very important to note that normally, like for the great majority of the loans that were given out, they were given to dictators. 
to unaccountable leaders. So it's not like Suharto was like, okay, let me take this deal. Let me go check with the people. Let's see if they consent. This was never the case. So like, like they, they, they were like, fine, like essentially, and I'll explain the conditions, but like, they were like, we'll, we'll do, we'll implement the conditions. Just give me the money. They never planned to pay it back. They knew that they, they didn't have to pay it back. In fact, and they would spend the money on, um, weapons and on security forces and on palaces and on just general petty corruption. Um, and then maybe a small amount would get left over to actually fund infrastructure and like good things for the people. But most of it was just like drained away from them. Um, and in, in return for taking the money, they had to do what, what the country had to undergo what is known as like structural adjustment, which is basically austerity. I mean, it would start with like devaluation of the currency was always like key, uh, restriction of the banking system. So like raising interest rates um, and subsidies on any food or energy. Um, there would be, for example, um, raising taxes was very common, like, like aggressively raising taxes. So this is basically austerity or basically like you'd want to like plunge the country essentially into a recession. Mm. And the, the, the general idea was like you'd, you, you want these countries to be really efficient at exporting the goods that we want. So you don't want them to have like high wages with healthcare and education. You want them to be really streamlined and to be like cheap. And we want those resources very cheap to make our lives cheaper on our side. So like generally speaking, IMF programs are designed to prevent Western style social democracies. They're designed to prevent free healthcare and education. They're designed to prevent even like modest subsidies on basic goods. But there were also frequently free trade stipulations in there too, right? Tell me more. What do you mean? Well, isn't the idea to increase trade between these, you know, frequently former colonial powers and their old oh, okay. colonies and other countries? The idea was South? to increase what's known as unequal exchange. Yeah. Uh, so, for example, the idea was to, 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 to keep the conveyor belt of stuff coming mm. from there. But, like, those countries aren't allowed to trade freely. Like, America has aggressive... Amer so, the whole, the whole, like, hypocrisy, I have a chapter in my book about this. The double standards are really the crazy part. Because as someone who's, like, identified as, like, as a classic liberal, mm -hmm. I don't necessarily think subsidies on food and energy are a good idea. Yeah, that was the other thing it, I was going to push it, back it, on. And, and I don't think of nationalization of companies is a good idea. Yeah. But when you have this double standard where you have the rich countries doing aggressive agricultural subsidies mm -hmm. and totally subsidizing healthcare and education and then turning to like little this like Britain for example with like the healthcare system they have the NHS and then they, they turned to a little Sri Lanka or Ceylon as it was called and they would say no you can't give free rice to your people anymore I mean that that's a double standard that creates inequality that's what's that's sort of just unequal right um, and that is what really exacerbated the issue uh, I mean if everybody was like judged on the same standard, then maybe it would be different, but that's not how it was. I mean, one of the main reasons Africa imports 85% of its food is because the United States aggressively subsidizes food production in the United States so that like it crowds out African producers. Mm -hmm. And I think another really, really important part of the Bretton Woods system, and then later the petrodollar system, is that the United States basically created military and political packs to force producers of really important things to only sell in dollars. So like for like little Malawi, they, they, or like Ghana, let's say, Ghana can't print CDs to buy oil. Like the America, we can, we can just print money to buy oil. Saudi Arabia won't accept CDs. So what does Ghana do if it wants oil? Well, contrary to what the MMT people believe, they can't just print CDs for dollars. If they do that, they go into hyperinflation. So they have to export stuff to earn dollars into their capital account, and then they, and then they can buy oil or, or dollars or euros or some sort of dollar substitute. They basically have to structure their economy to earn dollars. It's the only way they can buy fertilizer, oil, tractors, industrial equipment. They cannot print money out of like from their own printing press to buy the stuff. So this structures their economy in a particular way where they have to focus their national energy on exports so that they can get the dollars to pay off the interest, buy the oil, buy the weapons. Like Boeing is not going to accept CDs. Sorry. So it's like, this is just the way it worked. So all of these countries ended up getting like engineered by us. Mm -hmm. So again, the three things that we got out of the IMF and World Bank over the last 50, 60 years were interest payments, cheap labor and resources, and political control. I mean, some, some of the political control stuff is so shocking. I'm going to show a slide from the New York Times from 1978 tomorrow from Zaire, what was then Zaire. And it was very plain. The headline just said, um, 
Zaire takes like large loan from IMF and gives up economic control of its country. So basically the IMF staffed the, the treasury ministry of this country with its own people. Like we basically would take over these countries. It's completely wild. We sound like we're rooted in another era talking about like Zaire and Ceylon and all these things. <laughs> I know, but the people who live there today were alive then. Like yeah. it's important to remember that we're not that far away from that and that these policies, instead of like, it's not like they just ended in the 90s. Mm -hmm. the, the, the energies, of, I mean, the energies of the IMF did shift uh, like about 15 years ago. But most of their energy has been spent largely on the developing world. Uh, it's true that they shifted to help Europe. Mm -hmm. Like the IMF's loans to Europe were way bigger than any loans it had ever given to Latin America or Asia. But it was a similar thing. If you look at Greece, which was bailed out, yeah. right? One of these enormous bailouts. I mean, if you look at Greek wages, Greek wages are, are negative since 2008. So like the IMF programs uh, brought wage deflation to Greece. So like the elites did well in Greece. And they were bailed out. But the average person has had a really rough time. So, so like poor European countries were basically treated like the global south in this, in, this, in this example. And that's just been a brutal reality for workers and laborers in these countries in southern Europe. Like literally their, their, their wages have been deflated. And that's, that's kind of that was the point of colonialism. And that's sort of the point of the IMF and World Bank is to, is to again, get cheap resources and cheap labor. You talk a little bit in your book about how there was a lot of criticism uh, directed at these institutions back in, I believe, the, the late 90s, 90s was huge. Seattle did, protests, like everything. Did anything you know. change as a result of that? Or are we yeah. just seeing waves of criticism? Because it seems like like if the things that you are writing about mm -hmm. are in fact true, mm -hmm. this is a scandal. This is an outrage. <laughs> yeah. No, right? I mean, it was very clear. I mean... <laughs> I and mean, there's just many, many reasons why it's an outrage. I mean, another part is another reason is that like the people making the loan decisions like didn't come from these countries. Mm -hmm. There's a stat I use in the book from the early 90s where, um, again, this is 50 years of IMF and World Bank to that point. Um, less than 1%, I believe, of the decision makers making the loans to Africa were Africans. Mm -hmm. So it was just a very colonial like construct to begin with. But in general, um, yes, there was a ton of criticism uh, by you know, everyone from uh, Stiglitz to uh, the protesters in Seattle uh, to libertarians writing for um, Atlas and Cato. I mean, th there was a lot of discussion and, and debate about do we need these institutions? Um, and a lot of Global South leaders, you know, uh, created conferences like Arusha and others where they would get together and like basically condemn the IMF. And it was, I would say it reached a, a fever pitch like in the late 90s. In as a result, in reaction, they did pledge to reform certain things. Okay, so um, the, like, like, like the very, very, very poorest countries uh, can now qualify for like basically what they call debt relief, where maybe they can get loans that don't um, uh, have interest and, and maybe they can also get actually write-offs on some of their debt. But what you have to remember is that these are like 20 or 30 of the poorest countries in the world that constitute a small minority of the total lending of the IMF. Like the IMF and, and the World Bank target the big, juicy, meaty, industrial Global South countries. Like most of their lending historically is to Brazil, Argentina, Nigeria, Indonesia, Pakistan. It's not to Bhutan. Like it's, it's to these big industrial countries that have tons of resources. That's where we milked the most out of, where, where these bigger, bigger countries. So it's true that there was some reforms for like some of the very poorest countries in the world, but they still had to, they still have to undergo structural adjustment to get okay. the money that has not been reformed. Um, and again, they, like, like in a way they changed because their focus shifted, you know, for a decade or so to Europe. But after COVID ha all the lockdowns happened, they re-upped and, and as a result of the lockdowns and the money printing and now the raising of interest rates in the United States, now you're seeing a whole new spate of bailouts. It's just in the news every day, right? So Egypt's currently getting adjusted. Argentina's getting adjusted. Ghana's getting adjusted. Bangladesh is getting adjusted. So you're seeing a whole new round of conditionality. And people know. Like, the, it's not like, like, my book was written for Americans and for Europeans. I don't need to, I don't need to teach anything to someone from Ghana. They know quite well what an IMF structural adjustment is and they associate it with like like lower living standards and just like general recession. It's just like they know this. They, they lived it. They, they don't need me to tell them. But Westerners, I think you need to understand this because we just like 
We're not, we don't learn about this. It's, it's, that's why the book is called Hidden Repression. It's not, it's not known. Um, but now we're seeing it, that, that was an additional incentive for me to write the book, is that you're seeing a whole new wave of IMF bailouts all around the world of some of the most brutal regimes. I mean, Sisi in Egypt, um, the guy who's committing war crimes in Ethiopia, they got hundreds of millions of dollars from the World Bank. Um, I mean, you name it. There's, there's tons of dictators getting tons of money right now. And I just was like, what is going on here? And, and it's kind of like, again, like a, it's like a self-fulfilling cycle because like we, <laughs> we, we, we have an inflation crisis in the West. You know, we have a monetary crisis here. So the Fed raises rates. Uh, the world is not on the Fed's mandate. Mm-hmm. Like, like the impact of raising rates on Indonesia is not part of what Jay Powell has to consider when he raises rates. It's entirely self-interested domestic thing. So we raise these rates, we jack rates from like zero, close to zero to 5% or whatever. And this just causes like massive starvation and suffering across the world. Like if you look at, the FT actually does great reporting on this. And I say actually, because they would never publish like something like I'm, I've written, but they, they'll, they'll, they'll point out the, the data though. They'll, they'll show you that over the last two years or, or 18 months, as rates have risen and as structural adjustment has been introduced, uh, the price of bread in Egypt has skyrocketed. And, and it's really, really hard for people to get the same amount of food that they used to get. Like basically what, what happens in wage deflation is that the amount of time it takes you to earn a thousand calories of something like beef or rice or bread goes up instead of going down. And this is contrary to what you'd expect with human innovation and technology innovation. So like during the early seventies to the early nineties in a lot of these poor countries, I mean, the data is crazy and I have a section in the book about it, but I mean, you had countries where like the, 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 the amount of time it took you to earn as an average laborer, like a thousand calories of rice would go up by 50%, 100%. Instead of getting more rich and wealthy and prosperous and efficient, we were squeezing these people. And Zaire is, is the extreme case because, and this is shocking, like, so, so the structural adjustment began in the early 70s. So really in 72, it really started moving um, under Mobutu. And then he was ousted in around 95. Mm-hmm. Okay, so during that time, the country went underwent a, a lot of structural adjustment and received about $2 billion from the IMF. Um, and during that time, the Zaire, which is the currency of the country, uh, which, which was worth $1 in, in, in 72, was worth one billionth of a dollar in 1995. Now, of course, there's a lot of reasons for that, but, but a major, major underlying reason is because the country was squeezed and an enormous amount of resources were taken out of that country for, I mean, they have just like the most incredible resources of rare earths, minerals, uh, fossils, uh, all kinds of stuff, rare timber, everything. And, and, you know, that was all taken out of the country, primarily through debt. A ton of diamond mining too, right? Oh, I mean, just when I say minerals, that's what I mean. And and I mean, loosely, I don't know exactly what Black Panther is based on, but I think it's a, it's clearly like a colonial reaction to what happened to countries like the Congo, which really should be Wakanda, if you think about it. I mean, the amount of uranium in there, I mean, it's like, there's a lot of parallels there, right? So... Between Mobutu and uh, Kabila, it seems as though that will not, in fact, be happening. Yeah, and, 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 and you know, every loan requires someone to dance with. And that's the crazy part is that these these loans propped up these dictators. Like if the IMF didn't exist, and I know we had Cold War reasons, you know, we had the African Vietnam, we were, we were had the proxy war in Angola. Like, like there were reasons for us to support Mobutu, but like if the IMF didn't exist, Mobutu would not have lasted till 1995. <laughs> There's just no way. Um, but you know, you look, you look and you look at just the, the Marcos and Suharto and, and Portillo, and you just look at all these dictators and you realize like, the IMF prefers to work with undemocratic clients because it, it, if it works with a democracy, then there's like property rights and a Supreme Court and there's countersuits and there's protests and it's messy. Mm-hmm. No, they just want to work with someone who can just implement the, the structural adjustment and then they can move on. So this is partly what explains why they were working with the CCP and Mengistu's regime. And I also didn't find the Cold War thing fully explanatory because they funded a ton of left left regimes. like. Niere in Tanzania, Kuchescu in Romania, uh, Mengistu, Marxist guy, Marxist Leninist guy in, in Ethiopia. So you the CCP. So you look at it and you realize it's not just uh, they weren't just funding American allies. So, I mean, there was a really great libertarian book uh, called Perpetuating Poverty, written I think in like ninety three, ninety four, 
um, under the uh, at Cato, and and they 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 wrote something that was very uh, stuck with me, and it said basically like the IMF never met a dictator it didn't like, and I was just like what? So again, that originally sent me down this rabbit hole, but then you you, you realize that this isn't just a, a situation that harms poor countries; it benefits us tremendously. Um, yeah. Well, so how does Bitcoin fundamentally threaten this? Yeah, so... Does Bitcoin fundamentally Right, that's a great this? question. I mean, the, the short answer is we don't know. But what we do know is that a couple of things. Um, what, we, what we can notice is, is data, Bitcoin adoption data. So when you look at Bitcoin and cryptocurrency adoption data, which, which is like overwhelmingly Bitcoin and stable coins is what we're really talking about here. Um, you start to notice when you look at like just data over the last couple of years, that the rate of adoption of these things in countries that have been structurally adjusted is just like way higher than, than in the United States, which is much closer to like the global average, which is like internet users between the age of 16 and 64, 10% in America or so that have in some way used cryptocurrency. Okay, but then you, you move over and you look at Indonesia, Nigeria, Brazil, and the numbers are much closer to 18, 19, 20, 21, 22%. And, and they're increasing dramatically. So, you know, that's the big picture. Like what, 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 what kind of theories could explain that is that people are, people are escaping. I mean, this is one of the reasons why when the IMF, you know, in its ongoing adjustment of Argentina, it included a clause recently saying that like one of the conditions of this loan is that you try to crack down on, on Bitcoin and cryptocurrency usage. Mm-hmm. And this is one of the reasons why the IMF was not super happy about El Salvador adopting Bitcoin, mm-hmm. something that you know, was announced here, right here, two years ago. Um, they, they, they don't like things that can like disrupt their ability to like essentially farm people under a weak currency. They don't want any escape. They don't want people buying gold. They don't want people ha- getting access to dollars. They want them to stay in this weak currency so they can squeeze it and, and get wage deflation. So Bitcoin's an escape for that. So people are escaping via Bitcoin and stable coins. And I think that's really cool. Can it change the overall system? Nobody knows. Obviously, we can speculate, but but what we don't need to speculate on, what we're seeing real evidence of, is that people have an escape that they didn't have in the 1980s. Like if you were being structurally adjusted in Peru in the 1980s, there was no way to sort of escape. Like the currency was the currency and it was being devalued and, and the, your cost of living was going up and up and up. Today, you don't have to be stuck in Peru. You can, you can escape into Bitcoin or dollars um, without ID. And you can you can you can preserve your purchasing power or even increase it over time. That's not something that people had 20, 30, 40 years ago. So that's really cool. Again, does it does it change the whole system? We don't know, but like one would expect that if I mean if you look at what's happening in China right now, China's encountering issues because it can't print the reserve currency. So when a country defaults on a loan from China, like I mean, they have to basically take something as collateral. They have to like take over a telecom or something. It gets messy and China doesn't necessarily want to do that. So the, their, their loans are drying up. If you look at the data of like their infrastructure loans to poor countries, I mean, it, it was absolutely gargantuan up to like 2016, 2017, 2018, and then it's really fallen off. So they're encountering a lot of issues. And I, I think that, that that's evidence to show that the countries that issue the reserve currency who control the IMF World Bank, like um, we, we can do this in a much more sustainable way because it's just paperwork for us to give $30 billion to Brazil. It's not paperwork for the Chinese to give $30 billion worth of currency to Brazil. And that's a really serious thing to have to think about. But for us, it's like paperwork. So if we're, in a, if we're in a world where we eventually shift to Bitcoin being a reserve currency, then yes, we no longer can like do paperwork to bail out Brazil. We have to be quite prudent about it because it's a scarce resource and we have to actually think carefully about it. So I think, yeah, I think there'll be a lot less of these like infinite bailouts and less debt traps, or at least I'm quite hopeful of that. I'm curious about one other sort of related frontier Mm -hmm. is the Lightning Network going Mm -hmm. to fundamentally change the sending of remittances and receiving of remittances? I mean, I I think this is an interesting area um, because one of the reasons why there's so much unequal exchange in the world and, and, and so much disparity in labor uh, is because of the currency divisions. Um, if you have Naira over here and dollars over here, you can assen- you can eff- effectively like sort of cut these labor markets away from each other. If everybody's using the same currency, and you know Lightning is an is an easy way to use um, Bitcoin uh, in an instant way that's relatively cheap. Now it's certainly nascent and needs a lot of work before it could get to the scale that would actually change the world. But for individuals and corporations, it's making a big difference already. Uh, but if but if all of a sudden like y- you've got this global community or company, let's say, 
that's all in the same currency standard. I mean, that's a game changer. I mean, I, I think you, you start to have arbitrage in labor, like big time. Uh, one of the reasons you have arbitrage in global labor is, is because of the currency divisions. Again, like if you have everybody's earning the same type of currency, there's going to be a tightening uh, of the spread. Um, you can keep that spread artificially wide by, by having different currency regimes. There's like what, 180 currency regimes right now. Africa has 45 currencies. It's one of the reasons it's so poor. It get, like no one get, it's like not connected. It's terrible. But if Africa had one currency and that was the same currency we used here, I have a firm belief that that would, that would, that would really tighten the spread on labor and it would make exchange much more equal. I mean, obviously that's pure speculation, but like no one knows, but, but that would be, in my view, that would make a lot of sense. Hmm. Well, so what's the fix uh, mm -hmm. specifically with these institutions? Do you believe that they are so far beyond reform mm -hmm. and fundamentally ought to be abolished and ended or <laughs> is there a better solution that you've stumbled upon? Yeah. What do you see as the end? Because clearly this type of almost like predatory lending as you term it yeah. is something that I, probably shouldn't continue. I don't, um, look, I wrote the book just as almost like an exorcism type exercise to just like get it out. Like I don't, um, I, I, I tribute the book. I um, dedicate it in the beginning and I, I say it's for the victims of development. They may never get the justice they deserve, but they may get a way out. And that's how I feel. I don't think any of these people who perpetrated structural adjustment will ever go to prison. I don't think, I mean, we're talking about, if you think about the fact that, that under adjustment, uh, the country's uh, GDP goes down 10, 30, 10, 20, 30 percent sometimes over a decade. And if you, you consider that based on studies on large countries like Mexico, uh, for every 2 percent decline in GDP, mortality rate goes up 1 percent. I mean, we're talking tens of millions of people were killed by these policies. And no one, I don't think Larry Summers will ever go to prison for this. In fact, no one even knows that he was involved in this. He was chief architect of, of the economic wing of the World Bank in the early 90s. And he went to the White House. And now he's like telling us what to do on Twitter, like he's living in a mansion. Like he's not going to go to prison for this. None of these people will ever go to prison for structural adjustment that they perpetrated on the global south. So I don't think we're ever going to get justice. Um, but I do think that like people in the West should, should be more aware of what these institutions do. And if they disagree with my thesis, let's have a debate. Like I'd like to hear them explain why poor countries have exponentially rising external debt. And I'd like to hear their view on that. And how would they recommend that we, we adjust that? I know a lot of leftists like this idea of like the debt jubilee. Um, and it's an interesting one. I think that is certainly something that should be discussed as far as options. It'll of course never happen and I'll explain why. Um, when you lend something, when you lend money to, a thir to, to, to Mexico, let's say in the 80s, um, the, the reason why we, we went in and bailed out Mexico wasn't to save Mexicans, it was to save our banks that had lent that asset. <laughs> they, they, they traded an asset on their balance sheet by lending to Mexico, right? And then when that was at risk of, of going into default, they could do one of two things. They could they could take the write down and have that go to zero on their balance sheet, or they could lend another loan and grow their balance sheet. And the incentive is always for these creditors to grow and grow and lend and lend and lend rather than accept a, a, a basically a, shrink, a shrinking of their balance sheet. So, you know, we would always go in uh, not out of altruism. None of these bailouts, Mexico, Argentina, Korea, Thailand, Indonesia, they were never done out of altruism. They were done to save our banking system and prevent it from you know, going into a crisis. So I, I think that that's sort of Im important to realize. And I, I think that this sort of prevents any sort of big, big reform. Um, there's no, even though the Jubilee might make sense, and, and there's a concept called odious debt that actually was invented by Americans back 100 years ago when we defeated the Spanish in Cuba. Um, our there were policymakers in America that basically said that uh, the Cubans shouldn't owe the debt that the Spanish Empire had incurred because they were subjugating the Cubans. Why should the Cubans have to pay? But we, but the IMF and World Bank have never followed that precedent. So, for example, when a, when a colonialist got overthrown or a dictator gets overthrown, the people still have to pay back the debt that the dictator borrowed. So I use this statistic in my book, but in, in the middle 80s in the Philippines, when Marcos was ousted by a people power movement, the next year, 40% of the national earnings had to go to pay back interest that Marcos had borrowed. So there, there isn't an incentive to change based on how the system works. And if you look at the IMF structure, it's a colonial power structure, meaning it's, it's based on colonial uh, 1944 uh, power arrangement. It's not based on population. So the quota or the, or the voting share 
is such that like China has a similar uh, voting share to Italy right now, uh, and Britain has a similar voting share to India. I mean, obviously, we know that their economies and populations are not the same anymore. Um, America retains a unilateral veto of 18%. They can veto anything they want. Um, and they even have essentially a practical unilateral veto over microloan decisions, which require a 50% veto, because if you add up America and all of its allies, we, we can easily do that. So th there's no, I don't think you'll see internal reform. So I think I, I, as much as I'd like to suggest options like that we do odious debt cancellation, like JP Morgan's not going to like that. Like if, if we were to go out and cancel all of the odious debt, and we'd have to define it somehow. It's not like all the debt's odious. But clearly the debt that was lent to Mobutu and Marcos and Suharto was odious. You'd of course have to have some sort of line. Because I, libertarians would argue that, you know, money that democracies just borrow is odious. So you'd have to find a line. But maybe you could find a line and just say like, hey, at least we all agree that like this horrible dictator, like those people shouldn't have to pay that. Ironically, the US did it with Iraq after we invaded. Um, but like that's an exception. We usually don't allow that. So that would help, certainly, if you were to actually write off debt. The problem is, is that would shrink our banking system. So we don't have any incentive to do that. So again, I don't have like high prospects for reform. I do think as global Bitcoin adoption increases, I think the power of these institutions wanes and eventually they, they, they are forced to become smaller and, and more core to their original mission, as opposed to like sort of resource extraction machines. I think that they, they turn back into potentially like c collaboratively managed funds that do things in the common interest, like put out fires when countries have issues. Um, I think that that's possible, but I, I think that's only possible if there's a, a reform of the monetary paradigm. If we remain on this dollar hegemonic system, like there's just no one, no one has an incentive to change this. It's just, there's no, it, it, I use this, metaphor in the book, but it's like a drug dealer. Like the, 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 the Western creditors are dealing drugs to largely unaccountable governments in authoritarian countries. And there's no, there's no one there to like put you in therapy. Like there's no one there to say, maybe you shouldn't take this debt. And I mean, you have the additional moral complication of like, what if you're starving in Kenya or poor, like, like you may just want the debt. Like you may just want the debt. It's a short term fix. It's like being an addict. Like what? Like if you are an addict, like taking more drugs makes you feel better for like a day or whatever, or an hour or a minute or whatever. So you do more of it, even though you know long-term it's destroying you. So if you're living in Peru or Kenya uh, or Bangladesh or Ghana, I mean, it may be, even though you know that this is killing you and, and killing you, meaning like literally like killing a lot of people, you're going to take the debt maybe. And who am I to say that you shouldn't, you know, it, it's just a very, very difficult moral conundrum, I think. So why would countries gravitate toward use of Bitcoin instead mm -hmm. of just using the dollar? I don't think any country is going to like voluntarily move from control over monetary policy to not being able to control monetary policy. Uh, Seyfedina Moose has a great quote. It's something like, uh, the only thing dictators um, uh, would hate more than the dollar is giving up control over their own currencies. Like, so, so... If you look at Bukele, you have to understand that that was a dollarized economy. Like he already lost, he didn't have control over monetary policy. So to add Bitcoin wasn't a huge sacrifice for him. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So I think maybe, I mean, maybe you expect dollarized countries to think about Bitcoin also, or, or countries that are partially dollarized. Mm -hmm. Maybe they add Bitcoin, maybe, I don't know. But I, I think it's very unlikely that countries that control their own currency, um, that they would voluntarily dollarize or Bitcoinize is unlikely. I mean, I would really recommend Lawrence Larry White's new book um, on this topic. It's really good. And he's got a lot of expertise looking at dollarization in Latin America. There were some instances where it was bottom up and there were some instances where it was imposed. It's much more likely that any kind of big, like I do think you're gonna see more dollarization, first of all, like in the next decade, like mm -hmm. other fiat currencies are collapsing. So more and more people are just gonna use dollars, whether they get them via stable coins or via bank accounts or via just cash, I don't know. But like, I think you're gonna see more dollarization, both top down and bottom up, but mostly bottom up. But I think if we're gonna think about what would it look like for countries to actually Bitcoinize, I think we have to study Larry's work and we have to look at what happens when countries grassroots dollarize like uh, Cuba in the 90s or Venezuela uh, or uh, Ecuador, for example. And I think what starts to happen is you start to have 
this sort of Gresham's Law scenario where you have the legal tender um, and and people don't don't want it. <laughs> it's like not great, uh, meaning they don't want to save in it. They know it's weak, so so they'll save in something else. So they'll hoard gold or dollars or whatever. Uh, this comes from the days of like coin clipping with kings where they would like clip out uh, the gold and the citizens would notice which coins were, were clipped and they would save those and use the others. The others, others would circulate. The um, bad money would drive out the good, okay? Um, I think that that's kind of like probably gonna happen with Bitcoin for a while. Like if you can afford to save your Bitcoin, you're gonna save it. Like you'd rather spend the fiat, right? It's sort of obvious. Yeah. Like, like I would much rather spend fiat than Bitcoin if possible. But I think eventually this changes. If you study Larry's work with dollarization, you'll see that what eventually changes this is merchants. One day, the merchant is going to say, like, for example, today, some merchants like prefer cash to, to, to digital cash. And they'll, they'll say, um, oh, I'll give you a discount if you pay me in cash. Like if you're doing work on your house and you've got a guy coming in to do your floors, he may actually accept a small discount if you pay him in cash because people like the finality of cash. There's certain benefits of cash, obviously taxation, other yeah. things. Um, but they, but they, they, they'll actually like prefer cash to, to, to a check often, right? So I think you could start seeing this with Bitcoin eventually. Like one, once merchants are like, you know what? I, I want the Bitcoin. And in fact, if you pay me in Bitcoin, I'll offer a small discount. And eventually the merchants in these countries might just say, no, I just, I don't take fiat anymore. I just want your Bitcoin. That's how you'd have hyper-Bitcoinization. It, it could only be through this process of merchants demanding it and, and it's spreading through the economy. And that's something called Tears Law, which is the opposite of Gresham's Law, which is the good money drives out the bad. And th that's ultimately, I think, what you'd, ha you'd have to have something like that happen to see something like actual Bitcoin spread in an economy. And I think it's a grassroots thing. I don't think it's possible to impose as we've seen in El Salvador. I don't think it works. Like people, people don't like to be, Bitcoin's weird. It's different. It's totally strange and mysterious. And they think it's a scam. And in general, like they don't necessarily want it. Like they, like all these people who got the handouts in El Salvador, most of them just sold it for dollars. Like they're just, it's just weird and different. Uh, when I went down there, I met people who like they were taking their tips and saving it in Bitcoin, but like their salary, they wanted in dollars. Like, and maybe they were smart to do that, like short term, right? So um, I think that it's gradual. And I think that over time, it's, it's, it's probably a bottom up process. Like, I don't think you see governments choose to top down, dollarize or Bitcoinize unless they really have to. And, and I think that the, at, when, when they have to is when you start seeing them collect tax revenue in a different currency. That's when they've given up. So in Venezuela, they actually gave up and uh, it, 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 they're changing it now. They're going back and forth based on their economic condition. But when the Venezuelan government was, was taxing people in dollars, that's when you know they've given up on the fiat and it dies. So you just have to see what happens. Like, will one day governments just say, we're going to tax and pick on them? <laughs> then you know that then you know the fiat's dying. But I don't know. We, we never get there. Thank you so much. Thank you. I really appreciate that.